Kevin Robinson and her at 235 batting average, five for 18 as a pinch hitter. Jeff Richardson at second, running for Jeff Reed as Winningham fouls the pitch away. A well, ball of strikes to Herm Winningham. The Reds have hit the ball hard. Rooms shot one into right left field, leading off the inning, and then Madison grounded hard to Treadway, and that turned into a double play. Then Reed. Hit a line drive into right for a base hit, and Oster hit a shot up the middle to hit second base umpire Fred Brockland. So it's Richardson at second, Oster at first. The 1 1 to Winningham. Swung on, lined over the leaping blouser. Richardson will score easily. Oster will move to second. He'll have to hold there, and it's a 1 1 ball game. A blouser lead, but not high enough, and the Reds have tied it up here in the seventh inning. Herm Winningham in a bullet. Down in the left field, he picks up an RBI, and for Herm, that is his seventh RBI of the year. He's second in a pinch hitting role, and here's Mariano Duncan. for three. He swings and misses Acker's first pitch. Oster at second. Winningham at first. Two out to run in. The stretch by Acker the pitch. Duncan swings and chops one on towards third. That could be problem. Bare handing him throwing off the bag, and Oster will hold the third. Good save by Darrell Evans as Acker barehanded and threw and took Evans off the bag. So the bases are loaded now for Todd Benzinger. We'll pause for station identification on the Red Radio Network. Very pleasant weekend in store for the Tri-State. Tonight, partly cloudy and cool with a low of 60. And then for tomorrow, mostly sunny and pleasant with a high of 80. Lower humidity this weekend, too. Right now, 76 degrees at News Radio, 700 WLW. Well, Tony Davis out to the mound talking with Jim Acker, and he has back to play five benching. Oh, he got five hits in the inning, and three runners left, and the middle of the seventh. Reds one, Braves one. Might cost him a run, so he might hold back with a better pitch. Well, he's got that decision hard upon him here on a 3-2 pitch to a power hitter. He works, and there's a swing and a drive left field. Back goes Bell. Back to the wall on the track. He's got room, and Sari makes a catch. He made the catch. The ball died and came to him, and Mattingly will tag and score. George Bell looks like he open he threw him a fastball so he probably thought I can't use my curve here with the runner at third there's a possibility it might get by borders and it almost cost him a two run home run Barfield is up I look you if I don't know if you if you've got that kind of an experience behind the plate and you're gonna have to do some more work and Yankee Stadium, these are the New York Yankees. You can ill afford uh, that kind of on job training. There's a fly ball left field, right at Bell, hit sharply. This time there is no question, no adventure. And Bell just lines out, or uh, Barfield just lines out to Bell, and that will end the inning. It's a run, though, for the New Yorkers, made by Manningly, really, with the double, moved up on the wild pitch, and then the sack fly by Balboni. So the Yankees and cut the lead by one at the end of uh, six innings. They trail it five to two. CHOK with another Blue Jay win sticker license number, YMO 148. And now the pitch, strike, and the count is one and one. Mike Smithson versus Bud Black tomorrow. 
Black coming off that ball game the other day against Kansas City wasn't especially sharp but a little nervous pitching in Royal Stadium for the first time since he was traded but the Indians scored him 17 runs. Throw to first base back diving is James. And then Sunday Mike Bodiger who has been pitching extremely well of late versus John Farrell. Tomorrow start 120 Sunday 135 and the Indians take off on the road ball loose out of the bullpen. Indians will leave Monday morning to go to Milwaukee. One ball, one strike to Carter. James at first base, one out, two nothing Indians, sixth inning. And now the pitch. And Joe has to go down under one. He is hit by it. He is hit on the left hand by the pitch. I don't think he was hit flush. Skinned his knuckles. He's shaking that left hand. As he walks down to first base, gets a pat on the back from Pete O'Brien, the next hitter. Doc Edwards came out of the dugout and then quickly turned around and went back as Jimmy Warfield is attending to Carter there at first base. So the Indians trying to put some more distance between themselves and the Red Sox. Runners at first and second, one away, and O'Brien is at the plate. Now Jimmy Warfield, the Indian trainer, the all-star trainer, in Anaheim with the American League staff. And now, what do we have? Another ball loose? Or, yeah, another ball is loose out of the bullpen. And so, timeout. Does somebody chase that down? We can remind you on Sunday, August the 13th, it's a great day to be at the ballpark because the Indians and Friendly Ice Cream will be handing out complimentary life size growth posters of the man at the plate, Pete O'Brien. These posters will serve as a growth star for youngsters of all ages. All right, fans start to make some noise here at the ballpark. O'Brien in the box. Hit into a double play last time, swung at the first pitch, and was called out on strikes in the second. Runners at first and second, one away. Here's the pitch. Swung on, and a fly ball to center field, fading back is Romine. Still going back, he is there for the catch, tagging both runners, moving to third base, James, down to second base, Carter. Carter hesitating to see where the throw was going, and it went to third. So here is Joey Bell with first base open, and Kaminsk is on deck. Brad of the two-run home run in the fifth inning. So a deep out to center field off the bat of Pete O'Brien, but it moves the runners along to second and third. And a meeting of the mound now between Gardner and Gedman with Lamp still warming in the bullpen. One down, sixth inning. Two nothing in favor of the Indians. Looking for a sweep of this doubleheader. Well, the Indians swept the doubleheader earlier this year versus Minnesota. Here's Bell. Line to single to left field in the fifth. Grounded to shortstop in the second. Gardner works out of a windup with James at third. Carter at second. Swing and a miss on a breaking ball. Red Sox have really struggled on the road. They have lost five of their last six, six of the last nine, and have not been able to score runs. Their last 16 road games, they have scored four runs or less 13 times. And tonight, in game two, they're being blank after losing the opener 3-2. Swing and a foul down the right field side, out of play. 0-2 oh to Bell. No balls and two strikes to Joey Bell. Joey presently hitting a strong 294. A couple of home runs and 15 RBIs and a chance to drive in some more runs. At third base, James. At second base, Carter. Bell, right-handed hitter, very strong, poised and waiting. Gardner is into his windup. 0-2 pitch. And it's a fastball high. And again, Joey Bell. Showing good discipline at the plate. That was one of those pitches where a lot of young ball players are going to go swinging at it because just above the strike zone and very tempting, but he was able to lay off. Joey pinwheels the batter around and around. Dark stain wood. And now Gardner reaching for the ball, set to come back. One ball, two strikes. Outside corner target, and the pitch fouled away. Big rip by Bell off the facing of the press box and down below. Big scramble for that one. 
St. Louis with a one nothing lead on Montreal with play in the eighth inning. And now we're going to have Joe Morgan, the manager of the Red Sox, trotting out to the mound. So timeout. Take a look at the rest of the scoreboard. In the American League, game one of a doubleheader, Detroit besting Minnesota 6-4. to four. Frank Viola loses game number 12 this year. Rich the winner, 1-1. One and one. Viola now 8-12. and 12. No report on game two. Toronto 5, New York 2 in the seventh inning at Yankee Stadium. Bell has hit his 10th home run. Balboni number 12. 1-1 tie, Baltimore, Kansas City in the fourth. Morgan back to the dugout. Runners at second and third. Gardner checks over at third base and James and delivers 1-2 to Bell. On the outside corner, strike three call. So that will do it here in the sixth inning. No runs, no hits, no errors, and two men left on. And at the end of six, it remains the Indians two, the Red Sox nothing. Your Chevy Cumberland uh, Farms knows that if you work at... WCAU Talk Radio 1210. R.J. Reynolds will lead off for Pittsburgh here in the second. R.J. one for one in the first game, a pinch single driving in a run, and the pitch to him is over for a called strike. He's batting at 306. R.J. hitting 364 right-handed. He'll be followed by Glenn Wilson and then Junior Ortiz. Pitch to him, curveball, beaten, foul, past Gene Lamont, the third base coach. And it's nothing in two to R.J. Reynolds. Boy, St. Louis getting a great game from Ted Power tonight. Tower of Power is shutting out those Expos, one nothing in the eighth. Here's the pitch, fastball just missing inside, it's one and two. Rogers said the team that beats them more than anybody else, the Cardinals. One two pitch, fastball outside. It's two and two. And I think you have to pitch right handers against the Expos if you can. Now the two two pitch. Curveball swing and a miss struck him out. Might have been his fork ball. Reynolds goes down swinging. Williams has a good fork ball. That ball went down. Probably was his forker, and that'll bring on Glenn Wilson. Wilson went two for four in the first game with a double and two RBIs. He's hitting at 267. Pitch to him. Strike called. Nothing in one to Glenn Wilson. Now the pitch. Missing for a ball. One and one. Like to throw right-handers against Montreal. Like most teams like to throw left-handers against the Phils. Here's a pop foul. Coming back and out of play. It's one and two. Ball and two strikes to Glenn Wilson. Pirates, though, are throwing four straight right-handers at the Phillies. Which is inside for a ball. It's two and two. Of course, really, Jim Leland doesn't have any option. His left-hander, starting left-hander, is John Smiley, who pitches well against New York and beat New York the other night. Called strike three, struck him out. Fastball on the inside corner. Wilson was leaning over the plate looking for a breaking ball and took a heater on the inside corner. That's out number two. And it'll bring on Junior Ortiz, who's hitting a 217. No base runners here in the second. The pitch to Junior. Inside for a ball, one and nothing. Now the 1-0 pitch. Down and in for a ball. It's 2-0. and 
Two balls and no strikes to Ortiz. 2-0 pitch. Down and in. Ball three. Three and nothing. Now the 3-0 pitch. Over for a called strike. It's three and one. We're in the second. Nothing, nothing. Pittsburgh won the first game 10-5. 3-1 pitch. Swing and a hard ground foul on the third base side. And it's a full count to Junior Ortiz. Now the 3-2 pitch. Fastball. Hard shot past the diving Tom Hur and into right field for a base hit. Ortiz, a ground single to right. He's a two-out base runner for Jay Bell. Bell in the first game went one for five. It was a two-run double. He's hitting a 136. Pitch to him, big swing, no contact. Bell's picked up a couple of big base hits in the last two games. A, a double in this one to drive in a couple, and he had a bases loaded double against the Mets yesterday that won that game for Pittsburgh. Here's a one hopper to Dickey Thon. He lobs to Tom Hur for the force on Ortiz, and that will retire the side. No runs, one hit, no errors, and one left. We go to the bottom of the second at Veterans Stadium. Phil's nothing, Bucko's nothing on the CAU Phillies Baseball Network. Blue's very special features on Phil's GM Lee Thomas and manager Nick Laven. A historical look at the 1964 Phillies as we enter the 25th anniversary of that fateful team. Phillies yearbook available now at Veterans Stadium. Randy Reddy leads off for the Phils, and he takes a fastball for a called strike. One strike to Reddy, hitting at 257, coming into the doubleheader, 0 for 1 in the first game as a pinch hitter. Pitch to him, fastball strike, call, nothing in two. Two quick strikes to Reddy. Now the pitch. Missing wide for a ball, one and two. Here's the one-two pitch. Bouncing up there for a ball, it's two and two. Two balls and two strikes to Randy Reddy. Bottom half of the second inning, nothing, nothing. The 2-2 pitch. Up and in for a ball. It's a full count. Now the 3-2 pitch. Swing and a very high pop foul down the third base side. It'll be out of play. 3-2 to count to Reddy. Seven homers. He's knocked in 30. Here's the 1-1 pitch. 
swaying and a slicing fly ball to right. Ball and fast drops in front of Wilson. He keeps it in front of him, throws the first, and Thon gets back. Will he try to throw behind the runner, displaying that great arm, but Thon got back. A looping single to right by Dickey Thon. It'll bring up Charlie Hayes. At Houston's Astrodome, Terry Kennedy has just doubled. San Francisco has tied Houston 2-2 in the top of the fourth. Don Robinson against Jim Clancy in that one. Dickey Thon at first base with one out for Charlie Hayes. He went 0-3 for 3 in the first game. He's hitting a 2-23. the stretch in the pitch. Swing and he bounds one foul down the third base side. No balls and a strike to Charlie Hayes. Here's the stretch by Reed. Throw to first base. Dickey Thon gets back. Reed throws to first frequently. Now the stretch. And the pitch. Swing and he beats a foul back behind the plate. Nothing in two to Charlie Hayes. stretch. Two strike pitch. Line drive foul right field side. Still two strikes to Charlie Hayes with one out. Dickie Thon at first base here in the second. Nothing nothing game. Now Reed stretches. Two strike pitch. High for a ball. It's one and two. Steve Lake waiting on deck. Another throw to first base, and a balk has been called on Rick Reed. Called by first base umpire Mark Hirschbeck. The Reed called for the balk. This is a balk they used to call on Larry Christensen all the time. That he moves and he doesn't, doesn't step toward first. I, I can't see that, but I can't see the violation. Here's the one-two pitch. It's in the dirt for a ball. It's two and two. Dickey found it second on the balk. Now the stretch. Steps off and looks down back to second. stretch. The 2-2 pitch swing and a very high infield pop up behind the mound. Who wants it? Bobby Bonilla and Jeff King almost collided, but Bonilla reached higher than King and made the catch. Two down. It'll bring on Steve Lake. Hitting at 265 or 268. One homer, he's knocked in nine. Down at second base with two outs.
to bat. But one over for a strike of change. Missing to nothing. Maybe they'll just go up to it. Two balls, no strikes to light. Here's the 2-0 pitch. Swaying and a pop foul back it out of play. It's 2-1. Let's pause for station identification on the CAU Phillies baseball record. You're listening to Phillies Baseball on WCAU Talk Radio 1210. WCAU Two balls and a strike to Steve Lake. Dickie Thon at second with two outs here in the second. Nothing, nothing ball game. The stretch. And the 2-1 pitch. Swing and a bat handle. Pop foul coming back over the screen and out of play. And it's 2-2 two and two to Steve Lake. with a different ball from plate umpire Steve Ripley. Now the stretch. 2-2 two -two pitch. Swing ground ball hit to third. Fielded by Bonilla. Throws to first. A low throw and a fine scoop by Jeff King and that'll retire the side. No runs. One hit. No errors and one left. After two, Phil's nothing. Bucko's nothing on the CAU Phillies baseball network. Pitch to Thompson, and if they get him out, they'll likely walk Guerrero. Now Worrell, who will pitch the bottom of the ninth, goes to the bullpen to warm up some more. Daly pitched a heart-stopping inning in the eighth. No runs and one hit. One strikeout and no walks. Served one up to Garcia, who launched one in the left. Looked like he was going to leave the park and put the Expos on top. But Coleman made a soaring catch. Now Vince is a threat to steal. Hudler trying to keep him close. He leads away from second. Pickoff play and the throw back there is too late. All right, no score. The only marker in this game in the seventh on an error. Coleman takes his lead. He'll steal it if he gets a chance. Takes a big lead. Heston, the lefty, looks back there. St. Louis has won eight out of eleven from Montreal this year. Huddler at short, trying to keep Coleman close. Vince has a big lead. They'll try to pick him off again, I'll bet. Here is Hesketh stepping off, but no throw. Coleman's streak was snapped in the fourth inning after stealing 50 in a row, 44 of them this year. He was thrown out. Now he's at second, one out in the ninth, and strike one to Thompson. Big lead by Vince. The pitch. And in the dirt, blocked by Santovania. Coleman broke back toward the base as that pitch was made, made so he doesn't quite have a reading on this pitcher. Morel stays loose in the bullpen. Standing watching now. Coleman at second one on nine tight. Look back there by the left hander. Here is. The pitch, Coleman is stealing. It's low and away, and it gets away. And Coleman halfway home and goes back. Coleman steals his 45th of the year, and he is at third. And the Expo has got a lucky bounce. It eluded the catcher and went back to the screen and then bounced back toward the catcher. Coleman was eyeballing home plate but had to drop anchor. He's there with one out. The batter, Thompson, the count two and one, and the pitcher and catcher talk it over. Had Coleman seen the ball go in the dirt, he might have scored. He was split in the third by the time he got back to his feet. After a second, this year, he could go no further. He bounced up in a hurry and tried to make it, or he stumped him. 
Now the infield comes in. Milt Thompson could hurt the Expos. Runner at third, one out. Two balls and a strike to count. They'll pitch to him with Guerrero on deck. Thompson has a hit tonight. Swings and hits it to deep short, and the runner stays. The throw to first. He's out. A good play by Hudler. Well, Thompson with the infield in couldn't get it past him, and it's up to Guerrero if they pitch to him. That's a good play by Hudler. And Coleman would have been a dead duck had he gone for the plate. Let's see if they're going to put him on and pitch to Pendleton. That's what they're going to do. They're going to walk Guerrero. It'll be his first time on base tonight. It will be the first pass, the only pass. Excuse me. The second walk given to the Cardinals tonight. Fastball Perez walked one. Coleman's at third. He'll be joined on base by Guerrero. There will be two out in the batter Pendleton. He'll bat right handed and try to increase the lead. There's a chance of a double steal, but if Guerrero ran, they probably would just let him run. There's ball four, and Guerrero walks. Well, that was a big play when they got Thompson. Here comes Pendleton. He's 0 for 3. He'll determine whether it'll be a one run lead or better than that in the bottom of the ninth. Scott Terry runs for Guerrero. Scott Terry, the runner at first. Coleman at third, talking with the coach Hacker, the batter Pendleton. And if the Pendleton gets deep into the count with a couple of strikes on him, my watch for the Cardinals to run. Well, they're going to play behind Terry. They don't care if he runs or not. So they're not going to throw through and give the Cardinals a chance to steal a run. So it takes something from Pendleton with two out. From the belt, it's Heskip. Here's the pitch. Swing and a ground ball to deep short and a diving stop, but it is a base hit and a run scores. And the pinch runner made the difference. Cudler went diving to his right, backhanded the ball, righted himself, threw to second. Terry slid in, barely beat the play. Guerrero would not have beaten the play. Coleman scored the run after stealing the base, and it's two to nothing. And Buck Rogers, the manager, comes out. So Pendleton gets a hit and a run batted in. And with Bernanski up, they're going to go to McGaffigan out of the bullpen. So Haskett gives up a run, and he is roundly booed by the fans here. And the Expos make a pitching change. They bring in the right-hander, Andy McGaffigan. This summer is a special one for St. Louis because it marks the opening of a spectacular state-of-the-art center at the zoo. The Living World is the first facility of its kind to combine live animals and high technology to portray a unified view of life. At the Ecology Hall, you'll see animals in their own habitat. Visit a living Missouri Ozark stream. A cutaway view shows all the strata of the stream, the bed, currents, and the riverbanks. Projection microscopes light up the walls with three-dimensional pictures of the smallest creatures that inhabit the stream. It's something to see. And don't miss the other great zoo exhibits like Jungle of the Apes, Big Cat Country, and the Zoo Train. For more information on other great St. Louis attractions, call 1-800-247-9791 and get the St. Louis Sampler. To call, in Missouri, 1-314-421-1023. Ask for the St. Louis Sampler and be sure to visit the zoo. The Cardinals scored a run in the seventh inning on an error. And then they just scored a run here on the ninth. A single, a good sacrifice by Ozzie Smith. Stolen base. Coleman swiped third. And to stay there as Thompson grounded out. They walked Guerrero, and then Pendleton got the infield hit to deep short. There are a few plays here tonight where Spike Owen, had he been playing shortstop, would have made a difference. From well, McGaffigan into the game.
Here tonight, the Cardinals look like the first place team rather than the Expos. Yet Montreal leads the Redbirds by six. If the Cardinals can pull off a victory here, the Cubs will be within two and a half. And only two out on the loss side. The Mets will stay five out. They lost, and the Cardinals will be five out. You know, you come into a situation like this, and the big fear you have is that you'll be swept and go out of town nine games behind. the inside corner ball one they've been looking for McGaffigan to give Tim Burke some more help down in that bullpen it's one of the needs the Expos have another pitch to Branski is low and that's ball two I know they've eased a run across the plate here in the ninth Wallet guards the line at third. Outfielders play Bernanski straight away. Tom is driven in 58. The on deck batter is Okendo. Scott Terry leads away from second. Pendleton from first. Swing and a fly ball into right is foul and out of play. Tomorrow night, Ken Hill will be the Cardinal pitcher against Dennis Martinez. He's 11 and 1. He's won 10 in a row. So that'll be a chore trying to beat him. And the Cards haven't won this one yet. Two on, two out, top of the ninth. The pitch for Nansky took a strike, a good fastball. Two and two. That one fooled him. Time's a guess hitter, and he didn't guess right that time. Strikes and strike three on the corner. Fast ball on the corner in the end of the yard. One run, two hits, and two left. Cardinals have left four, lost a man stealing, hit into a double play. They get a big run here in the ninth, some more breathing room for Todd, Todd Worrell, who goes to the mound. We're into the bottom of the ninth inning. The Cardinals two and Montreal nothing. Smith started. Pete Smith, six and two thirds. Jim Aker, an inning and a third. Baber in his second inning of work. Duncan Fowl straight back. Now it evens one and one. The Braves got their run in the first inning. The Reds, their run coming in the seventh. Baber's one one to Duncan. Swung on, and that's popped up to Thomas at short. He has it two away. Well, two down, Todd Penzinger steps in. Todd has struck out three times and four times to the plate. His last time, that's coming in the seventh, with the bases loaded to end the inning. Benzo has hit 10 home runs for the year. Drew in 44. Baber delivers to him, and it's a strike on the outside corner. Well, Baber features a palm ball, and you don't find too many of those around baseball anymore. Fly ball hit the deep right center field. Going back is Lemon. He'll have the room, makes the catch. Imagine the third is Harper. He'll come in the score. And that's the game. 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 That's
for a couple minutes past the news at uh, 10? Okay, sure. Sure, okay, sure. Because <laughs> actually we could put on, I'm going for you. I'm and the batter is Tommy Hurry, walked in the first inning, had an infield single in the third. Five runs on six hits for the Phils. Reed with a pitch, swing and a miss, strike one. One strike pitch, swing and a miss. Rolling two. The American public. However, that money, that fight is going to Dickie Tan, an RBI single. Charlie Hayes, a three-run homer. Lenny Dykstra, a run-producing double. 5-1 Philadelphia, bottom of the fourth inning. O2 pitch. Swing at a foul ball. Back to the net. A year ago, Rick Reed pitched effectively in his first big league start against the Mets and then ran into trouble in his second major league outing here at Philadelphia. Similar story for Rick this year. He pitched very well against the Dodgers last Sunday and has run into trouble here in the fourth inning tonight. 0-2 pitch. He is up high. field now a bunch of paper that we have to get taken care of Charlie Hayes home run I don't know if you mentioned that take a look at the scoreboard 433 feet as we should point out as we talked about the ball reaching the upper deck at the vet easier to homer to the upper deck here than say Three River Stadium. You got to throw a the configuration, the, the structure is a bit different than Three Rivers as, as Pirate fans try to compare the two ballparks. Hey, well, those round comes around, the Cubs are going to have some games coming up with Philadelphia. These teams go pretty much straight up and stand back enough as much as it is in Three River. Here's the pitch, and it's low and outside. Well, some ideas are comparing here. We talk extensively when we come in here about the All right, well, I appreciate that. I wasn't aware of that. He's sidekick with the best pitching staff in the National League East. Back here at Veterans Stadium where the Phillies lead 5-1 to one in the nightcap. 2-2 two and two on her. the bell. Now he steps off. Didn't like the lead that Dykstra had at second. The Toronto Blue Jays have been on a tear and they won another one tonight beating the Yankees 6-2 to two behind John Cerruti who's 7-5. and five. Dave LaPointe is the Yankee loser. He's 6-9. and nine. George Bell with a Toronto home run is 10th. Steve Balboni hit one for the Yankees is 12th. Breaking ball hit in the air to center field. Right there is Cangelosi. Puts it away for the out. Her is retired for the second out. The home run 
one by Charlie Hayes hit to the upper deck here was the 34th left field upper deck home run as the Pirates now give an intentional walk to Hayes. The last guy to hit an upper deck home run here for the Phillies was Mike Schmidt who did it back in 86. So it doesn't happen all that often. The ninth batter to come to the plate for the Phillies this inning is passed intentionally, and they'll go to the guy who started it all, Dwayne Murphy. With a bunt. He did indeed. A bunt single to third base. I think the longest one here still belongs to Willie Stargell, who hit that tunnel up in the right field 600 level. Andre Dawson hit one here last year, but the last Philly to do it was Schmitty in 86. He gets in. He's one for two. The tenth batter to come to the plate in this five run inning for the Phillies. Two on with two out. The set by Reed. Here's the pitch. Outside ball one and there's still nobody warming. It's up to Reed to get out of it. by Reed. Next pitch to Murph. Fly ball, well hit the center. Cangelosi has to turn and scurry back, but he's there now, and he makes the catch for the out. Murphy flies out to end it, but a big round for the Phillies. Five runs, six hits, two men left, and at the end of four tonight, the Phillies lead 5-1 CAU Phillies Baseball Network. 100 years. 0-2 oh, now on Parrish. Parrish backs away from the batter's box. He's in the hole now. 290 at bats for Parrish. 10 doubles. He has a triple and 13 home runs. He has scored 39 for California. While doing a good job behind the plate, here's the pitch. Way outside, Dotson was not going to make a mistake to Parrish on 0-2. Now we'll see what Dotson deals with. Parrish batting, two men out. Chili Davis at first. Greg Walker is holding there. Lyons plays up the middle at second. Guillen plays a deep shortstop, and Martinez is not that far off the line at third. The pitch on the way. Outside ball two. Two balls and two strikes. Yesterday, California scored five in the first on the way to an 8-5 win. An oddity in the game. The White Sox had 13 hits. The Angels had five. Walks played a big part in the game. Abbott won, Perez lost, and Harvey saved the game. The 2-2 pitch. Swing and a foul ball back and out of play. The count remains at 2-2. Two two. The White Sox will finish up this series on Sunday, and then they'll be playing against the Oakland Athletics Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday before returning to Comiskey Park. The count two and two. Dotson with the sign, a look to first. The pitch on the way. Swing and a ground ball to Ozzie. He goes to Lyons at second, forcing Chili Davis. So Parrish hits into the force play. The Angels are out in the second inning. No runs on a hit and a man left. That's the first runner stranded by the California Angels after two. One nothing White Sox on the White Sox radio network. Bring your rocks back. Three two pitch. Swung on and missed. He strikes out the seal. But not until another run has come in. The Twins come up with three runs on three hits and error and a walk. And we go to the Tiger half of the fifth. It's Minnesota four, Detroit two. Even when I was very young, I knew that having goals was important. Well, it may not look like much now, but when I get a new typewriter, I'm really going to get some stuff published. And as I grew up, my goal is to feel a little more sophisticated. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But when I see that for that label, credit. We're locked up in a 1 1 tie in this game, top of the third, and George Brett steps in for his second at bat. Melito Perez offers high with a fastball, ball one. Brett fly to center. That average down to 221. Boy, who could forget the season he had in 1980, though? 
at 390. One-0 pitch is high for a ball. Two and nothing to cap to George Brett. John, the thing that I remember most about that season, not so much that George Brett hit 390 and flirted with 400, but the fact that he was a bona fide power hitter. He had 24 home runs that year, had over 600 bats, and struck out only 22 times. You talk about a phenomenal year making contact. Pitch is high, ball three. He handled all the press and all of the tension involved with trying to bat 400. Now, the team helped him out. The team was running away with the division at the time. Perez bent over the waist as he gets the sign from Carlton Fisk. We'll see if Brett gets the green light at 3-0. He does not swing, and he takes a strike. It's 3-1. He had 306 last year, 290 the two previous seasons, 335, 284 back in 1984. That's his lowest average since 74. Swing and a pop-up on the right side, and that one will drift out of play. But there's a section in the press guide, Wayne. Brett's hitting after injuries. Now, let's just list the injuries. 77, a right elbow. 78, left shoulder twice. 80, right heel, right ankle, right hand. 82, right wrist. 83, left toe. 84, left knee and left hamstring. 85, right hamstring. 86, right shoulder twice. 87, rib cage and right knee and knee surgery this year. And he said this year is his most frustrating. Just go back over that track record. Because he hasn't been able to hit coming off the disabled list like he has so many times before. He drills it to deep right field, and George Brett has gone downtown. A home run, his third of the year. The wind tried to knock it down. Calderon went back to the wall, but he was a spectator. And George Brett who had four doubles in his last four games coming into this series, has just launched a home run to put the Royals ahead 2-1. to one. And it appears that he's right back on track. That is the 11th home run surrendered by Melito Perez. It came on a 3-2 count. Well, you're right, Brett hit 331 after all those injuries. His at bats coming back after all the injuries we mentioned. And he'll be back there before too long. He can still hit the baseball. Yes, he can. Bo Jackson can hit a baseball. He takes his strike. Although he is going to strike out his fair share. Bo Jackson so far this season has struck out a total of 79 times. 18 homers, 49 runs batted in. He singled his first time. It takes a high fastball, one ball, one strike. Like to mention, our big payoff inning tonight will be the fifth inning. Jackson, by the way, with that RBI in the first inning, now has 50 runs batted in. Melito back to the plate. There's a bounding ball past the mound, slowly hit the second, charged by Lyons. He'll have to hurry and does and gets Bo Jackson. Jackson, you don't have to hurry as much as you have in the past with his problems with that quad muscle in the left leg. Four to three in the put out, but the home run by George Brett makes it a two to one Kansas City lead as we go to the bottom of the third at Comiskey Park on the south side on the White Sox radio network. Miller Genuine Draft. For those who've discovered its rich, smooth, real draft taste, the world is a very cool place. When the heat gets hot, tap into the cold. The sensation has begun. When the heat gets hot, tap into the cold. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 
Chicagoland Northwest Indiana Toyota dealers want to talk to you about Celica. It's got the stats. Twin cam, 16 valve engine, 135 horsepower, front wheel drive, front buckets. And option packages on Celica GTS will save you $1,050 on air conditioning, ETR radio with cassette, cruise control, and power package. Celica, a real all-star at your Chicagoland Northwest Indiana Toyota dealers now. Savings based on MSRP of individual options on selected models. Actual dealer price and customer savings may vary. With all the traffic out on the road these days, it seems you can't get a traffic report fast enough. That's why WMAQ All News 67 has traffic center updates every 10 minutes every day. Only on WMAQ All News 67. The third annual Coca-Cola Miller Lite Shy Sox golf outing will take place on Monday, August the 7th at Oak Meadows Golf Course in Addison. All golfers will receive a shared golf cart for the 18-hole best ball tournament, a gift bag, lunch on the course, an awards banquet dinner, and a portion of the proceeds will benefit Shy Sox kids. Ozzie Gian leads it off for the White Sox in the bottom of the third and takes strike one from Brett Saberhagen, who, for the second time tonight, is pitching with a lead. Two to one ball game. Four hits for the Royals, two hits for the White Sox. The pitch is poked foul, left side and out of play. Ozzie hitting 228, 21 RBIs. Come join us for that golf outing on Monday, August the 7th at Oak Meadows Golf Course in Addison. And to make your reservation, call 924-1000. That's the third annual Coca-Cola Miller Lite Shy Sox golf outing. A reminder that following each ball game, we select a Miller Lite White Sox player of the game on WMAQ, and we'll do that following tonight's contest. The pitch to Ozzie again is an inside-out swing, and he fouls it. Flares it to the left and into the seats. Nothing into the count. Gallagher to follow, and then Steve Lyons. The Royals simply do not like playing in Cleveland, Ohio. They have lost 18 of their last 24 ball games there. They just finished a four-game set with the Indians. The pitch is fouled off the catcher's mask of Bob Boone, and he took a shot that time. You know, Jim Sundberg took a similar shot in that two-game series with the Rangers. So he will adjust... That catcher's mask makes sure that all the bars are still there, covering his face, protecting him. And, of course, Ozzie again continues to talk with him. The Royals, remember we talked about it the other day. They had that four-game set against the Indians, lost three out of four. Here's a breaking ball, tapped to the left side, charging as the third baseman sights it, throws off balance and throws it away, goes into the photographer's well, and Ozzie Guillen will have, I believe, a base hit and the error that allows him to go to second base. We'll see how they'll score it. It is a base hit and an error. The error on the third baseman Seitzer, who just committed his 11th of the season. He led all third basemen in errors in each of the last two seasons. And that puts that tying runner out there at second base. You know, the way Saberhagen got off the mound in such a hurry, he's probably the best fielding pitcher in the American League. I know that there are some other arguments. Perhaps there are one or two others that could be in that group. Here's Gallagher, pushes a bunt up the first base side. Saberhagen quickly off the mound, and Gallagher is going to run back to the home plate area. And... Folks, he's out. He's going back to the dugout, and now the home plate umpire, Terry Cooney, finally calls him out. There was no tag play and no throw to first. So Gallagher gets the sacrifice down, moving Gian to third base, and the play will go one unassisted. How can they give it two unassisted? Because he went back to home plate, and there was no tag of play, no tag by the pitcher. That's the ruling by the score. Okay, the sacrifice done by Gallagher. Infield plays in, and the batter is Steve Lyons, who swings at the first pitch and fouls it away. So Saberhagen fields the ball with no tag. They give the put out to the catcher. Because he was closest to the plate, I guess. I guess. I have not seen that play. I haven't either. I've always seen a tag. Yeah. You, we say you see something new at the ballpark. Yeah, we sure do. There's a new one for this game. It's a weird one. The pitch is low for a ball. Throw down to third, and Gian gets back in. Sites are taking the throw from Boone. Well, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me if the pitcher fields the ball. 
You know, I could understand it in certain circumstances, but now when a pitcher feels the ball. One ball and one strike is the count. Two unassisted. That's a new one. We'll have to check with the official scorer on that one. Saberhagen works out of the stretch and the pitch of the plate swung on and popped up down the left field line in foul territory. Sights are running over but won't make a play. He can't get there. But I was just talking about Saberhagen. His ability to field his position. He is outstanding around the mound. The bunt up the first base side. They didn't even make it halfway down the first base line before Saberhagen had pounced upon the ball and Gallagher took a U-turn and went back, stepped on home plate, and then went to the dugout. And still no call by Terry Cooney, the home plate umpire, and then finally said, well, I guess I might as well call him out and raise the right hand. One and two. Tying run at third base. And here's the pitch to the plate. Swung on, a drive into left center field. Eisenreich back there to make the catch. Tagging at third base is Gee, and he is going to lope in and make it. And we have a tie ball game, 2-2. So two sacrifice flies by the White Sox in this game. So very good clutch hitting on the part of the White Sox. Fisk driving in the run in the second. And Steve Lyons, who had struck out his first time, atones for that by getting the sacrifice fly to drive in his 19th run of the year. Yeah, it went one unassisted. Went in and talked to the official score about it. That makes a whole lot, that of, makes sense. A lot of sense with the pitcher feeling the ball. So here's Harold Baines. He struck out his first time and takes the changeup. And that missed a bit high. Ball one. Well, that's something I've never seen, though. A batter just stop between home plate and first and then go right back to the dugout without even being tagged out. The pitch is fouled away, and he did say two unassisted, didn't he, on the last I thought figure. so. No, he told me he said one unassisted, but that yeah. sure sounded like two to me. It didn't make sense. Not when a pitcher fields the ball. And he said he said one as clearly as could be, so my mistake, I guess. Ed, can you fix that loudspeaker, please? Pitch is outside for a ball. Or the guy talking on it, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> that is two one uh, unassisted. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that makes a whole lot more sense because Saber, I can have the ball. The 2 1 pitch, and that's low for a ball. 3 and 1 is the count. Well, it was in that New York series where a batter did the similar type thing. Ball hit to Manningly, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> he came back to the dugout. Or was it Manningly? I can't remember. He was involved in the play whether he fielded the ball or hit it. Swing at a foul out of play. Amazing how you can forget so many things during the course of a season. And then you remember the things that just aren't even important. Like your name. No. Saberhagen, age 24. Winner of seven games this season. He's a winner in his last four starts. And the payoff pitch. Called strike three on a fastball outside corner. And Baines is KO'd for the second time. Strikeout number four in the game for Saberhagen, but the White Sox scored a run. An infield hit, an error, a sacrifice, and a sacrifice fly. They do it textbook style. We'll go to the fourth. We're tied at two on the White Sox radio network. MAQ News Time 844. It's 65 degrees at O'Hare. Weather Command calling for fair and cool conditions with an overnight low of 52. These are the stories we're following at WMAQ All News 67. The jury now deliberating in the Operation Incubator trial of former Circuit Court Clerk Morgan Finley and former City Hall aide Clarence McLean. Uh, Mayor Richard Daly saying his office has uncovered a multi-million dollar scandal in the city housing department. Illinois Senate President Phil Rock is ready to reintroduce House Speaker Mike Madigan's proposal for a two-year hike in the state income tax. The Supreme Court is saying it won't rule until Monday on an abortion case from the state of Missouri. The News Watch never stops. I'm Lynn Holly, MAQ All News, 67. So, Mona, yeah. when I heard that the new Geo Metro is the highest mileage car sold in America, mm -hmm. I knew it was for me. Oh, yeah, well, I'm not surprised. You're a real woman of the 90s. <laughs> yeah, especially on days like today. For starters, I dropped off the kids at daycare in Barrington. Uh -huh. Then I drove up to a meeting in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Back down to my office in Chicago. No. Then over to my aerobics class. Then all the way back to Barrington. Oh. Picked up my dry cleaning. I don't believe it. Oh, well, believe it. With a car that gives me 58 miles per gallon highway 
Highway 53 City? Honestly, Kath, I don't know how you do it. I couldn't yeah, do that. Yeah, and then I scooted down to a surprise birthday party in Orland Park. I'm exhausted. And now I'm finally home. Look at yourself. Yeah. You are completely out of gas. I know. But my Geo Metro isn't. The new Geo Metro. It gets around. Sold and serviced by select Chicagoland and Northwest Indiana Chevy dealers. The Royals are coming to bat at inning number four. And the White Sox and the Royals are tied at two. And Jim Eisereich grounds it out to the second baseman, Lyons, who has it, throws to first, and Eisereich is retired twice now, grounding out to second base. What a way. The White Sox tribute to former slugger Greg Luzinski will take place on Saturday, July 15th. That's when the Sox and the Brewers get together for a 6 o'clock ball game. A spectacular fireworks show sponsored by Drumstick Ice Cream, co-sponsored by WMAQ All News 67 will follow that game July 15th. The Ticketmaster number, 559-1212. Jim Eisenreich has been retired twice by Belito Perez, and he's been a hot hitter. He had hit in 15 of his last 16, and we noted earlier that he came in here with an average just under 300. He has been a very pleasant surprise for the Royals in 1989. Here's Tabler now. He singled his first time up. The windup and the pitch to him is outside ball one. The Royals have always had the tremendous pitching. They were very interested in Richard Dotson with Floyd Bannister going down with the shoulder surgery schedule. But when, from what we understand tonight, Richard Dotson has come to terms with the White Sox and will start Saturday night against these Royals. Fastball delivered for a strike. One and one the count. Last year, the White Sox won seven of the 13 games played between the two ball clubs. Perez back with a breaky ball. That's swung on, hit in the air to shallow center field. Gallagher coming in. He's got a gauge finally now and makes the catch. Two gone. Here's one from the headline, Under the Gun. Santa Monica police said that Dodger outfielder Kirk Gibson and his family were robbed at gunpoint outside their house. An armed man confronted Gibson, the 1988 National League MVP, demanding Gibson's car and several hundred dollars in cash, and Gibson gave the man what he wanted, and the gunman fled. Thank goodness. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a shame. Well, I'll tell you. I remember Joe Garagiola in his house last year getting robbed. Pitches low for a ball to the left-handed batting Matt Winters. He struck out in his only at-bat tonight. And there in Scottsdale, Arizona, took a lot of Joe's baseball memorabilia, World Series ring. Next one is offered low and inside. Two balls and no strikes. Well, thank goodness they're safe. But knowing Kirk Gibson, that gun must have scared him because he's about as tough a customer as you would ever want to come across. The pitch jams him, and he fouls it out of play. You no, know, Mad Winters, here's a great story. A guy who has toiled in the minor leagues for 12 years. We talk about Dave Gallagher for eight years. This guy's been in the minor leagues for 12 years, came up, got a pinch hit double in his first at bat. Not only did they get him the baseball, and he saved that, but he saved the lineup card just to prove that he was there. Takes a fastball high. And it's 3-1. and one. Matt Winters in right field tonight. Came into the game with a 316 average. So when he has gotten to the major leagues, just like Gallagher, over 300. He had a lot to do with helping Jim Eisenreich on his comeback. In the minor leagues, they were roommates. Takes a fastball in there for a strike. And it's a full count, 3-2. and two. The answer is 1 hour, 48 minutes. What is the quickest game in the major leagues tonight? Atlanta 2, Cincinnati 1 at Cincinnati. No triple plays tonight for the Reds, however. Swing and a high fly ball into left center field. Dan Pasquale in the alley now makes the catch and the side is retired. Three up, three down against Melito Perez here in the fourth. We'll go to the bottom half at Comiskey Park with the score. Kansas City 2, White Sox 2 on the White Sox radio network.
All the news you need without the wait. Only on WMAQ. All News 67. Hey, Chicago White Sox fans, here's how you can get a free ticket to a Sox game. Milk Duds Caramels and Johnny Rancher Candies are going to take you out to the ball game this summer. Look for an order form wherever Milk Duds Caramels or Johnny Rancher Candies are sold. Attach proofs of purchase to the order form and you're on your way. See complete details wherever Milk Duds and Johnny Ranchers are sold. To get your ticket, bring the completed order form to Comiskey Park or to any of the 70 Chicagoland Ticketmaster locations. Tickets subject to availability. Hurry. Offer ends July 26th. Hey Chicago, we're starting you on. Get stuck with a stick. See your Chicagoland and Northwest Indiana Chevy dealer now for free automatic transmission on Chevy's all-new full-size pickup. It's the bottom of the fourth. Kansas City and the White Sox first to four over the weekend and a 2-2 tie in this one. Yvon Calderon leads it off and he takes a strike. He had a base hit in the second inning. He was advanced to third on the double by Pasqua off the right field fence, and then Carlton Fisk delivered him home with a sacrifice fly. Sacrifice fly by Lyons in the third, scored Gian to tie up the game. Next delivery is ball one, one ball, one strike. The Royals had their best record ever in the month of April, 16 and 8. Swing at a foul on the breaking ball. And as a matter of fact, you, you take a look at all those successful. Royals teams over the years and gives you an idea just how good they are this season. They had their best record ever at the 62 game mark with 100 games remaining. They were 38 and 24. The pitch fouled down the right field line and out of play. Then they promptly dropped four of their next five, scored just in two of the next 28 innings. And that's when John Watson made what he considered the critical move of this season for him. He started changing that lineup altogether. The pitch is fouled away at the plate. Not only did he take out Danny Tartable as a cleanup hitter, but he put the number six hitter, Bo Jackson, into the cleanup spot, and that's where he is performing tonight. Tartable out with that bruised left knee. He switched everybody except one constant in the lineup, and that was Willie Wilson, the leadoff hitter. Here's the pitch, and the big curveball drops in for a called strike three, and Calderon is not at all pleased about the call. Fifth strikeout for Saberhagen. Terry Cooney got an earful. And here is Dan Pasqua. He delivered that double in the second inning. John Wathen has been a royal his entire career. 19 years. Drafted in 71. Came up to the major leagues in 76. And then after the 85 season, coached with Omaha, the AAA affiliate in 86. Managed in 87 until the latter part of August, then became the manager of the Royals. Ball one issued to Pasqua. Here's the windup and the pitch. In there for a strike, one and one. all those injuries that the Royals have had they've only had their big guns in very few games swing and a miss on a fastball and it's one and two to Pasqua in fact the Royals have played 22 of 75 games this season with Brett Tartable and Jackson in the starting lineup and they've won 17 of the 22 do you think they're important that's a tune of 77 percent Tartable out tonight 
Curveball is in the dirt. Two and two the count to Dan Pasqua. Pasqua wants the home plate umpire Cooney to check that baseball. He had watched Saberhagen rub it up a little bit. Cooney says it's all right. It's all right with me. Saberhagen with a 2-2 pitch. Fastball swung on, hit into left center field, but Pat Tabler is playing there. Comes in a couple of steps now as the wind knocks it down. Makes the catch for out number two. How to bring up Carlton Fisk. My partner, John Rooney, grew up in Richmond, Missouri, not too far from Kansas City. You used to watch the Kansas City A's. It's a very tough thing for me to realize, but the Royals are playing their 21st season in the American League. And their lead announcer has done the Royals every year, starting with that 1969 campaign, Denny Matthews. He was working with Bud Blattner to begin with, and then took over the lead role when Bud left. Fisk takes strike one. Saber Hagen continues to throw strikes. You heard Monty Moore. Monty Moore, George Bryson, Red Rush. Red Lynn Rush. Ferris. The old redhead, huh? You ever playing the quarters game with him? No. Fastball is outside for a ball. That's his claim to fame. One ball, one strike. He has a quarter in his hand, and you're supposed to reach in and grab it, and nobody can. I think Magic Johnson took it from him once. Red cried for days. Fastball inside. Two and one the count. They'll check with the first base umpire, Drew Coble. He says no swing. Kind of brings a tear to my eye. It really does. Never forget Red Rush in basketball. Player at the free throw line. 2-1 pitch is fouled away. That one got a piece of the home plate umpire Terry Cooney. That hit his mask, and now he's checking with Boone to say, hey, what, do we have the same mask? Does it have a magnet on here or what? All three there at the home plate area have been smacked with a foul ball tonight. Fisk, Boone, and Terry Cooney. Red Rush saying the guy at the free throw line, he eyes it. He tries it. He buys it. <laughs> on every free throw. How many free throws are <laughs> put up there through the course of a basketball game? Here's the pitch. Curveball, strike three call. Fisk wanted to call time and step out of the batter's box and then went back in and took a call third strike. Two strikeouts of the inning. Six in the game for Saberhagen. Through four, we're tied at two on the White Sox radio network. I'm WMAQ morning anchor Pat Cassidy. And before you hit the road tomorrow, check in with us first to find out what's happening on your route. Nobody gives you more traffic information in the morning than we do. So keep your dial set right here and wake up tomorrow to WMAQ. All news, 67. These days, business trucks are required to transport just about anything. Pianos, chickens, eggs. But whether you're hauling clocks or gravel... You can be sure one truck will always be built to your exact business needs. An international truck. That's because being the number one manufacturer of medium and heavy duty trucks in North America, we offer a full line of advanced trucks for virtually every application, be it for lumber or beverages. And because your certified international dealer is a truck specialist, he'll help you choose the right axles, transmissions, engines, and provide you with all the service needed to keep you delivering typewriters or newspapers day after day. So whether you haul peanuts or packeter, come see how much better the 27 new international trucks drive your business. For the trucks that can carry your business, come see City International Trucks at 4655 South Central Avenue in Chicago or call 496-7500. Maybe you never heard of Sherwin-Williams Style Perfect brand carpet, but I bet you have heard of DuPont Stainmaster, Monsanto Wear Dated, BASF Zeftron, and So5 Worry-Free. See, those are the fibers that go into our Style Perfect carpets. And fibers, not brands, are what makes for quality in a carpet. What makes a carpet last and wear and resist stains. So, if you're shopping for real quality in a carpet, come on in and ask Sherwin-Williams. We are going to eye it, try it, and buy it. It's called a station ID. We'll pause 10 seconds for stations to identify themselves in the White Sox radio network. 
is your home for White Sox baseball. All News 67, WMAQ, Chicago. Ed Murphy's our engineer. I'm Wayne Hagan, and John Rooney has play-by-play -play chores in the fifth. Bob Boone will be the leadoff batter. Boone, Fisk, and Terry Cooney in a conversation at home plate, waiting on Melito Perez to get ready to work. Perez has given up two runs on four hits so far. George Brett's home run made it a 2-1 ball game in the third, but the White Sox came back in the bottom of the third with an unearned run to tie the game. 2-2 the score. It's Boone, Frank White, and Kurt Stillwell. And here's the pitch by Perez. It's a strike on the outside corner, just above the knees, a fastball. 0-1, Boone walked and then was doubled up in the second inning. A little looper hit out to second base by Frank White. Lyons caught it, and Boone was caught off first base. On one strike, ground ball back to the pitcher, down on his knees to stab the ball. Perez, and he throws to first base. Quick reaction by Melito. Kept that ball from rolling over the mound and on through into center field. One man out. Boone denied a hit on a good reaction by Melito Perez. Now here's Frank White. White hit into the double play in the second inning. He's 0 for 1. Frank White from Kansas City. A product of that Royal Academy that owner Ewing Kaufman started in Florida. A pitch outside. Very expensive proposition. Just a few players made it out of there into pro baseball. Here's the 1-0 pitch. There's a swing and a high fly ball left field. Pasquo waiting in his tracks. Still waiting. Makes the catch. Frank White flies to left field and with two gone. Kurt Stillwell, the shortstop, will make his way to the plate here in just a moment. Keep in mind, the bottom of the fifth inning is our big payoff inning tonight. Greg Walker, Eddie Williams, Ozzie Guillen will be batting. If anybody gets on in the fifth inning for the White Sox, Dave Gallagher will be coming up. That's in the bottom of the fifth. Right now, top half of the fifth, a 2-2 game. The Royals have out-hit the White Sox 4-3, and Kansas City has the game's only air, and that led to the White Sox tying the ball game. Stillwell one for two. The pitch to him. A ball high. He popped out his last time up. He singled and scored the Royals' first run. He led off the game with a base hit and came around on a two-out single by Bo Jackson. Here's the pitch. Swing and a foul ball out of play off to the left. One ball and one strike. Melito Perez has been working with a former Kansas City pitcher, former Kansas City A's right-hander Orlando Pena. Here's the 1-1 pitch, a ball in the dirt. Trying to get a little better control of Melito's split-finger fastball. Ready to throw more of a forkball. Not to throw the pitch so hard where it ends up in the dirt all the time. Or occasionally it will find the strike zone. The 2-1 pitch over the inside corner at the knees, strike two. Two and two on Kurt Stillwell, a switch hitter batting left-handed. Melito Perez bending in reading signs. Now the 2-2 pitch on the way. Split finger pitch in the dirt. Ball three, three and two. On deck, Kevin Seitzer. There are two men out. Pasco plays in some in left field and over toward the line. Gallagher, the center fielder, is shading the hitter toward left. Galderon playing straight away in right field. Hitting room in deep right center for Kurt Stillwell. Now the 3-2 pitch. Swing and a pop foul off to the left. Eddie Williams giving chase over by the stands. No play. And Stillwell offered on a pitch up and away. That would have been ball four. Kurt Stillwell was a man who replaced Ozzie Guillen in the All-Star game last year. Ozzie was injured. He did make the trip to Cincinnati as a representative for the White Sox, but did not get to play in the ball game. This year's All-Star game to be played at the Big A in Anaheim. The 3-2 pitch. Stillwell swings, hitting a ground ball to Lyons. He plays it on a roll and throws to Walker, retiring Stillwell, and the Royals go 1-2-3 in the top of the fifth. We're halfway through the game. We go to the bottom of the fifth, our big payoff inning. Kansas City 2, Chicago 2 on the White Sox radio network. 
MAQ News Time 905 Clear Sky 63 degrees going down to a low tonight near 52. These are the stories we're following at WMAQ All News 67. Today was the first day of deliberations in the Operation Incubator trial of former Circuit Court Clerk Morgan Finley and former City Hall aide Clarence McLean. Mayor Daly uncovers what he calls obscene favoritism in the city's Department of Housing. ComEd defends its decision to charge ratepayers $62 million in consultant fees. Chicago Special Events Director Kathy Osterman pushes the idea of having a permanent lakefront site for the ever-growing list of city festivals. State Senate President Phil Rock to reintroduce House Speaker Mike Madigan's temporary tax hike plan, what with, but with one big change, a provision for property tax relief to double. President Bush pushing some changes in the way political campaigns are financed. The Supreme Court has taken another dramatic pause. No decision on the Missouri abortion case until Monday at the earliest. And now a WMAQ Sports Center. In the bottom of the fifth inning, our big payoff inning, Greg Walker offers on the first pitch from Brett Saberhagen, fouling it back to the screen, strike one. Greg is batting for Mr. Donald Mura of South Holland, Illinois. Here's the next pitch, and Walker swings and misses strike two. For a single, our contestants receive a $100 gift certificate from the Suitery, a double, a $200 gift certificate from Sunset Foods, a triple wins a snapper lawnmower, a home run, will win a Zenith 25-inch console color TV from Chicagoland Zenith dealers. Walker swings and fouls it away, so he stays at nothing and two, leading off the bottom of the fifth inning in this 2-2 game. Now, Grand Slam will win our contestant a Toyota van. If your batter makes an out or a sacrifice or a walk, then we have a great consolation prize for you. Mr. Donald Mura, South Holland, Illinois, represented by Greg Walker. The two-strike pitch, a curveball outside and low. Kansas City got a run in the first. The White Sox tied the game in the second. Kansas City got a home run from Brett in the third inning. Then the White Sox got an unearned run to tie the game in the bottom of the third. Walker swings, fouling it away, staying alive at one and two. To enter the big payoff inning, send a postcard to the big payoff, WMAQ AM, Merchandise Mart, Chicago, Illinois, 60654. Eddie Williams on deck, then Ozzie Gian. If anybody gets on here in the fifth inning, Gallagher will bat. There's a swing and a high drive. Deep right field. That ball's way back, and this park won't hold that one. It's gone a home run. Greg Walker tees off for home run number three, giving the White Sox a 3-2 lead. Hold the presses. John Rooney is giving away a television set. Donald Mura of South Holland, Illinois, wins a Zenith 25-inch console color TV from Chicagoland Zenith dealers thanks to Greg Walker's home run and a big payoff it is for Mr. Mura. You knew the fifth inning was going to be lucky. 371 feet on the home run by Walker. Eddie Williams swings, lifting it down the right field line. The ball falls foul. So he was up there swinging that time. He wasn't taking. The pitch was around home plate. Williams hit it just foul down the right field line. He's batting for Tim Jacobs of Algonquin, Illinois. I think the wind is blowing in from center field. What do you think? The smoke will be in our press box booth here in a couple of seconds. You okay? Yeah. The next pitch to Eddie Williams. Curveball. High for a ball, one ball, one strike. Looks like that restaurant near your house in the mornings. The smoking section. Oh, man. Here's the 1-1 one -one pitch. There's a swing and a drive into deep left field. That might go. Good. No, it's off the wall. Off the top of the wall. And into second with a double. Eddie Williams, and boy, he hit that hard. Getting back there in left... Left center field, Pat Tabler, and I thought that...